Victorian short stories of troubled marriages. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Poor Stick by Arthur Morrison Tales of Mean Streets, London, Methuen & Co. 1894 Published by permission of Methuen & Co. Mrs. Jennings, or Jinnins, as neighbours would have it, ruled absolutely at home, when she took so much trouble as to do anything at all there, which was less often than might have been. As for Robert, her husband, he was a poor stick, said the neighbours, and yet he was a man with enough of hardihood to remain a non-unionist in the erector shop at Maidment's all the years of his service. No mean test of a man's fortitude and resolution, as many a sufferer for independent opinion might testify. The truth was that Bob never grew out of his courtship blindness. Mrs. Jennings governed as she pleased, stayed out or came home as she chose, and cooked a dinner or didn't, as her inclination stood. Thus it was for ten years, during which time there were no children, and Bob bore all things uncomplaining, cooking his own dinner when he found none uncooked, and sewing on his own buttons. Then, of a sudden, came children, till in three years there were three, and Bob Jennings had to nurse and to wash them as often as not. Mrs. Jennings at this time was what is called rather a fine woman, a woman of large scale and full development, whose slatternly habit left her coarse black hair to tumble in snake-locks about her face and shoulders half the day, who, clad in half-hooked clothes, bore herself notoriously and unabashed in her fullness, and of whom ill things were said regarding the lodger. The gossips had their excuse. The lodger was an irregular young cabinet-maker, who lost quarters and halves and whole days, who had been seen abroad with his landlady, what time Bob Jennings was put in the children to bed at home, who on his frequent holidays brought in much beer, which he and the woman shared, while Bob was at work. To carry the tale to Bob would have been a thankless errand, for he would have none of anybody's sympathy, even in regard to misery's plain to his eye. But the thing got about in the workshop, and there his days were made bitter. At home things grew worse. To return at half-past five and find the children still undressed, screaming, hungry and dirty, was a matter of habit. To get them food, to wash them, to tend the cuts and bumps sustained through the day of neglect, before lighting a fire and getting tea for himself, were matters of daily duty. Ah, he said to his sister, who came at intervals to say plain things about Mrs. Jennings, you shouldn't go for to set a man again his wife, Jen. Many are doing light work, I know, but there's natural to her. She ought to be married to a swell stead of me. She might have done easy if she liked, being such a fine girl. But she's good-hearted, is Melia, and she can't help being a bit thoughtless. Whereat his sister called him a fool. It was her customary good-bye at such times, and took herself off. Bob Jennings' intelligence was sufficient for his common needs, but it was never a vast intelligence. Now, under a daily burden of dull misery, it clouded and stooped. The base wit of the workshop he comprehended less, and realised more slowly than before, and the gaffer cursed him for a sleepy dolt. Mrs. Jennings ceased from any pretence of housewifery, and would sometimes sit, perchance not quite sober, while Bob washed the children in the evening, opening her mouth only to express her contempt for him and his establishment, and to make him understand that she was sick of both. Once, exasperated by his quietness, she struck at him, and for a moment he was another man. "'Don't do that, Millier, he said, "'else I might forget myself.' His manner surprised his wife and it was such that she never did do that again. So was Bob Jennings, without a friend in the world except his sister, who chid him, and the children, who squalled at him. When his wife vanished with the lodger, the clock, a shade of wax flowers, 
Bob's best boots, which fitted the lodger, and his silver watch. Bob had returned as usual to the dirt and the children, and it was only when he struck a light that he found the clock was gone. "'Mummy took to clock said Millie, the eldest child, who had followed him in from the door, and now gravely observed his movements. "'She took for tock, and went to ta and she took for flowers.' Bob lit the paraffin lamp with the green glass reservoir, and carried it and its evil smell about the house. Some things had been turned over, and others had gone, plainly. All Melia's clothes were gone. The lodger was not in, and under his bedroom window where his box had stood, there was naught but an oblong patch of conspicuously clean wallpaper. In a muddle of doubt and perplexity, Bob found himself at the front door, staring up and down the street. Diverse women neighbours stood at their doors and eyed him curiously, for Mrs. Webster, moralist, opposite, had not watched the day's proceedings, nor those of many other days, for nothing, nor had she kept her story to herself. He turned back into the house, a vague notion of what had befallen percolating feebly through his bewilderment. "'I don't know. I don't know,' he faltered, rubbing his ear. His mouth was dry, and he moved his lips uneasily as he gazed with aimless looks about the walls and ceiling. Presently his eyes rested on the child, and, Milly, he said decisively, "'Come and have your face washed.' He put the children to bed early and went out. In the morning, when his sister came, because she had heard the news in common with everybody else, he had not returned. Bob Jennings had never lost more than two quarters in his life, but he was not seen at the workshop all this day. His sister stayed in the house, and in the evening, at his regular homing time, he appeared, haggard and dusty, and began his preparations for washing the children. When he was made to understand that they had already been attended to, he looked doubtful and troubled for a moment. Presently he said, "'I ain't found her yet, Jin. I was in hopes she might have been back by this. I, I don't expect she'll be very long. She was always a bit larky, was Melia, but very good-hearted.' His sister had prepared a strenuous lecture on the theme of I told you so, but the man was so broken, so meek, and so plainly unhinged in his faculties, that she suppressed it. Instead, she gave him comfortable talk, and made him promise in the end to sleep that night, and take up his customary work in the morning. He did these things, and could have worked placidly enough had he but been alone. But the tale had reached the workshop, and there was no lack of brutish chafe to disorder him. This the decenter men would have no part in, and even protested against. But the ill-conditioned kept their way, till at the cry of Bella, when all were starting for dinner, one of the worst shouted the cruelest jibe of all. Bob Jennings turned on him and knocked him over a scrap heap. A shout went up from the hurrying workmen with a chorus of Save you right! and the fallen joker found himself awkwardly confronted by the shop bruiser. But Bob had turned to a corner and buried his eyes in the bend of his arm, while his shoulders heaved and shook. He slunk away home and stayed there, walking restlessly to and fro, and often peeping down the street from the window. When, at twilight, his sister came again, he had become almost cheerful and said with some briskness, "'I'm a-going to meet a gin at seven. "'I know where she'll be waiting.' He went upstairs, and after a little while came down again in his best black coat, carefully smoothing a tall hat of obsolete shape with his pocket-handkerchief. "'I ain't wore it for years,' he said. "'I ought to a wore it. it. "'It might have pleased her. "'She used to say she wouldn't walk with me in no other "'when I used to meet her in the evening at seven o'clock.' He brushed assiduously, and put the hat on. "'I'd better have a shave round the corner as I go along,' he added, fingering his stubbly chin. He received, as one not comprehending, his sister's persuasion to remain at home. But when he went, she followed at a little distance. After his penny shave he made for the main road, 
where company-keeping couples walked up and down all evening. He stopped at a church and began pacing slowly to and fro before it, eagerly looking out each way as he went. His sister watched him for nearly half an hour and then went home. In two hours more she came back with her husband. Bob was still there, walking to and fro. "'Hello, Bob,' said his brother-in-law. "'Come along home and get to bed, there's a good chap. "'You'll be all right in the morning.' "'She ain't turned up,' Bob complained. "'Oh, else I've missed her. "'This is the regular place where I always used to meet her. "'But she'll come tomorrow. "'She used to leave me in the lurch sometimes, being naturally larky. "'But very good-hearted, mind you. "'Very good-hearted.' "'She did not come the next evening, nor the next.' nor the evening after, nor the one after that. But Bob Jennings, howbeit depressed and anxious, was always confident. Something's prevented her tonight, he would say. But she'll come tomorrow. I'll buy a big blue tie tomorrow. She used to like me in a blue tie. I won't miss her tomorrow. I'll come a little earlier. So it went. The black coat grew ragged in the service, and hobbledy-hoys, finding him safe sport, smashed the tall hat over his eyes time after time. He wept over the hat, and straightened it as best he might. Was she coming? Night after night, and night, and night. But tomorrow. End of A Poor Stick by Arthur Morrison.